Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to everyone here today at the Getty Villa and to those of you who are attending uh, online in the virtual sphere. We at the Getty are thrilled to have all of you with us here today for a very mini symposium on the Herculaneum papyri, culminating in the awarding of the grand prize of the Vesuvius Challenge. I'm Kenneth Lapotten, Curator of Antiquities here at the Getty Villa Museum. And thank you. For, for, for the Getty Villa Museum, uh, this year, 2024, marks the 70th anniversary of Mr. Getty establishing his museum and opening it to the public in his home, the ranch house, just up the hill to your right as you leave this auditorium, and the 50th anniversary of the opening of the villa itself in 1974. Yes. <laughs> the Getty Villa, as many of you know, and I will explain briefly uh, later on, is closely modeled on the ancient Villa de Papyri at Herculaneum, the fine spot of the Herculaneum Papyri, the successful virtual unwrapping and reading of which we celebrate today. So, so we at the Getty are especially pleased to be hosting this event. Now, before we begin, I'm required to do a bit of housekeeping, and I also want to thank many people who helped put together today's event, in addition to our wonderful speakers, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Special thanks are due to our team here at the Getty Villa in public programming, specifically Lisa Guzetta, Shelby Brown, Laurel Kishi, Adam Atamian, and Janessa Reeves. And without them, this wouldn't be happening. I'm also grateful to Heather Lisey and Lars Francisco in our events department. Yay. Our crack AV and visitor services team throughout. And from the Vesuvius Challenge, I want to particularly thank Stephen Parsons and Emily Ambergi for their wonderful collaboration in the organization. So, before the culmination of today's event, when Nat Friedman, tech entrepreneur and Vesuvius Challenge Prize co-founder, uh, will award the prizes and celebrate the winners, three of us will speak and briefly address very aspects of the Herculaneum Scrolls to provide greater context for the momentous breakthrough and the new beginning marked by the solving of the Vesuvius Challenge. I will speak first on the history and archaeology of the Villa dei Papiri, the site where the papyri were found, and it is, as I've said, the model for the Getty Villa. Then Dr. Federica Nicolardi, a renowned papyrologist from the University of Naples, will tell us more about the ancient texts that have already been recovered and physically unscrolled and what those texts say and their importance of their content in the ancient world in Greece and Rome to give us broader context. She will be followed by Dr. Brent Steeles, alumni professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Kentucky and co-founder of the Vesuvius Challenge and a former Getty Scholar, among many other accolades. And it's his pioneering work in digital humanities and especially virtual unwrapping that has made the solving of this challenge possible for others. And he, I think, Brent, will trace more than 250 years of attempts to open and read the scrolls in about 15 minutes, right? <laughs> He's always been a quick study. But first, I'd like to give a shout out to one of our guests here today, uh, Fabrizio Diozzi, 
of the Office of the Herculaneum Papyri at the National Library in Naples, who greatly facilitated the loan of three scrolls from the library to our 2019 exhibition on the Villa dei Papyri here at the Getty, when we were able to divert those scrolls from Naples to the Getty to UCLA Dental School for some scans for doctor skills. And I want to invite a very special guest to the podium, Dr. Philippe Hoffman of the Institut de France, whose scrolls received as a gift from the Neapolitan court hundreds of years ago were the actual scrolls that were the subject of the prize competition. So please welcome Dr. Philippe Hoffman of the Institut de France. Dear colleagues, dear winners of the Vesuvius Challenge, ladies and gentlemen, mesdames et messieurs, on behalf of the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres and its permanent secretary, Professor Nicolas Grimal, I would like to express their warmest greetings to you on this magnificent occasion. The Academy and all researchers interested in the study of papyri and more particularly ancient philosophy and Epicureanism, salute the extraordinary scientific progress that is being celebrated today and congratulate the winners of the prize we are going to celebrate. I would especially like to convey the greetings of Professor Daniel Delattre, whose commitment to constant collaboration with you is well known and who presented the lecture to our academy the 8th of March on the subject of a spectacular discovery of papyrus number four. As you know, the six papyri from Herculaneum preserved in Paris, which belong to the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres, have a singular history. In 1802, they were entrusted to the Classe des Lettres of the Institut de France by the first consul, Napoleon Bonaparte, who had received them as a diplomatic gift from the King of Naples, Ferdinand IV. The Classe des Lettres, now the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres, was given the task of studying these precious documents. The scientific discovery we are celebrating today, which is part of exchanges and collaborations between scholars from our countries, fulfills the wish expressed by Napoleon Bonaparte. On this occasion, we must pay tribute to the memory of Professor Jean Leclan, former permanent secretary of the Academy, who constantly supported research into this papyri from Herculaneum. The French community of specialists of Epicureanism, led by Daniel Delattre, is particularly attentive to the novelty of the text that has been brought back to us and is ready to participate in its philosophical study. We are delighted that in the near future, Professor Brent Seals and Mrs. Christy Chapman will be coming to speak to our academy about these discoveries. Finally, I would like to express our admiration and warmest congratulations to all the researchers who have made possible this extraordinary discovery that will occupy us this afternoon, and to the winners of the prize, and to thank you personally for your magnificent hospitality. Merci. So, J. Paul Getty never saw the Villa dei Papiri. He had two villas in Italy built on ancient remains. So in a sense, this Getty Villa is the third Getty Villa. And many times 
Early in life and later, he visited both Pompeii and Herculaneum. But the Villa dei Papiri, in his day, was entirely underground. And today, remains more than 90% underground. But Getty, after various plans and changes of plans, when his museum in his house, just up the hill to the right, the ranch house, became too small, he decided to build a replica of the ancient Villa dei Papiri. And here you see a grainy photograph of him in his home outside of London in Surrey looking at a plan of the Getty Villa, which was then under construction. Getty and others knew of this ancient villa, which they could not see, because of the magnificent finds in the Naples Museum that have been on display there after moving from the local museum at Portici next to Herculaneum in the early 19th century. And here I just show you a slide of a scene of Ingrid Bergman in Rossellini's Viaggio in Italia from 1954, the time that Getty was traveling to Naples looking at one of the many statues from the Villa dei Papiri. And Getty knew the history of the villa, not just from the statues, but also from frescoes that had been cut up out of the walls of the ancient villa and were on display in Naples. And what must have appealed to Getty greatly is that all indications were then, and still are, from the papyrus scrolls that have been unrolled. And here I show you one, along with that plan uh, that I'll talk about a little more, that the villa was owned by the Pisones, Lucius Calpurnius Piso Caesoninus, a Roman of the highest consular rank, who married his daughter Calpurnia to an impoverished Roman patrician named Julius Caesar. When Caesar married Calpurnia, I think he was marrying up. In any case, this association with Caesar appealed to Getty, who liked to collect objects that were associated with famous people in the past, be it the Emperor Hadrian or Louis XIV or Marie Antoinette. And this association with Caesar is something he wrote about in his diaries. Getty, as I mentioned, he had a villa, his villa on the Bay of Naples was, um, if I can make the pointer work, and maybe I can't, there it is, at Posilupon here. Here you see Herculaneum on the slope of Vesuvius, more famous Pompeii down here. These are all other sites uh, where ash has been found from the eruption. What you see in the middle of the slide isn't a smudge. Um, it's the ash cloud from the eruption of Vesuvius. And you can see how Pompeii was buried by the ash moving south from south winds. Herculaneum, closer to Vesuvius, buried by the same eruption, but very differently. Much more deeply by pyroclastic flow, what is here PF on this schematic. You have the magma chamber, the eruption cloud, the cloud, the fallout of ash, which buried Pompeii with a little bit of pyroclastic flow. And you can see Herculaneum, massive pyroclastic flow. There was little or no lava. This fanciful painting, like many others, made in the 18th and 19th century after the excavations, fantasized what the eruption of Vesuvius might have been based on uh, 18th and 19th century eruptions, which had lava. But lava would have burnt and destroyed everything. Ash and pyroclastic flow carbonized and buried and paradoxically preserved everything, even the fragile papyri. So the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 has been given by volcanologists the name Plinian because it was described by Pliny the Younger, who 
whose father was adopted father, Pliny the Elder, was the admiral of the Roman fleet. And it was an eruption not like these 18th and 19th century more tame eruptions of Vesuvius. And you see Jacob Moore has actually put Pliny the Elder collapsing and dying on the coast in the foreground of his painting. These eruptions were more like Mount Pinatubo or Mount St. Helens, massive eruptions with clouds of degree carbonizing everything. And Herculaneum, unlike Pompeii, which was buried under 8, 12, 15 feet of ash, Herculaneum was buried under 75 feet of volcanic debris. And it was only excavated and brought to light, for those of you who have been to the site and see the city, by massive efforts by, Mussolini, by the Italians under Mussolini. And this is the site pretty much as you see it today, not of the Villa dei Papiri, but of the town of Herculaneum. And in the background here, you can see Vesuvius with its top blown off. But this isn't the top that's blown off. This is the top <laughs> that's blown off. OK? So on this um, early 20th century plan, you can see the town of Herculaneum. The shot I just showed you was taken from about here, looking up to Vesuvius here. And here's the Villa dei Papiri, still underground, next to the city of Herculaneum. It's massive sea frontage, because the ancient coastline is here, having been pushed out by successive eruptions. You see the villa, which actually is longer than this, is three or four city blocks. This is the kind of wealth and power. I tell visitors to the villa that our villa has been turned 90 degrees from the sea to fit into the narrow canyon. That's topographical. Our villa is one to one of the Villa dei Papiri, but only, as I'll show you, the central portion, and it had much greater sea frontage, signaling the wealth and power of the Pisones. We know most of what we know about the ancient villa thanks to one man and his team, a Swiss military engineer named Carl Weber, who was working for the kings of Naples. Think of the Swiss guard at the Vatican. The Swiss were working as mercenaries throughout Italy. And it was Weber who was called in to direct the excavations for the king of Naples after well diggers had struck a circular polychrome floor here, which wasn't a huge surprise in 1750 because excavations of the town and the theater had begun in, earlier in the 18th century. And then excavations at Pompeii began in 1748. But it was the richness of the finds in the floor that uh, inspired the king to uh, acquire the land and make special excavations. And you can see the tunnels are first somewhat uh, higgledy-piggledy, uh, but then they become more regular. But the floor, this splendid polychrome floor, of which we have a replica here at the Getty, and you can buy caps and t-shirts and bumper stickers and clocks and umbrellas, if you like, um, in the gift shop, this was what Weber first found, measured, drew, and lifted, and it was first installed in the royal palace near Herculaneum and has now been installed in the museum in Naples. So on the left, you see the original floor now in late Naples and the replica floor we have not in its archaeological find spot at the end of a long path for a Belvedere, but inside the museum by the statue of Heracles, which was probably Mr. Getty's favorite object. The floor, the bronze statues, some 60 of them that we have replicas in our gardens, 30 marble statues that we don't have replicas of, the papyrus scrolls, frescoes, were all removed from tunnels, vertical shafts and tunnels done, dug through the volcanic debris by Weber and his team. These are two of the tunnels that have recently been cleaned and re-excavated. And you can see that one of them has been walled up. There were poisonous gases. There was fear of collapses. And rather than lifting all the dirt and debris to the surface, Weber and his team started rearranging and moving that dirt underneath. But it was dangerous work. It was painstaking. 
And it was, it was deadly, at least to Weber, who died in his 50s of, of lung disease, probably from inhaling so much of the ash and gas. But Weber's plan is full of information because it's annotated in Spanish, which was then the official language of the Neapolitan court. And um, it's keyed. So here you see, early on, the floor, digging tunnels, things that were found. And D marks the first statues, four bronze statues found on the 28th of January in 1751. They're how high they is, and they're cupids with dolphins and jars, and here's one of them in Naples. And through Weber's plan, where for some of the important statues, he actually draws them in, we know where they were found. Weber got in trouble with his royal overlords because they wanted statues, frescoes, and then eventually when they learned of them, papyri from the royal collections. Weber, trained as an engineer and architect, wanted to know what this place was. At first he thought all of the columns that he found were part of the forum of a great city, but then he realized he had a villa. This is the first ever archeology span excavation plan we know. And I think that one of the things that's so fascinating about the Villa dei Papiri is that now for more than 250 years, 274 years, the villa has kept giving and giving, and it's been a place where cutting edge technology, whatever that is of the day, has been brought to bear to bring to light greater knowledge about the ancient past. Today, we celebrate the winners of the Vesuvius Challenge who have used virtual unscrolling and machine learning and AI to read these closed papyri. Weber applied cutting edge mining engineering. Father Piaggio, whom I think we'll hear about later, who first tried to open the scrolls physically, mechanically, while damaging them, invented cutting edge methods. And there have been other methods. And then in more recent excavations, careful digging has found well-preserved wooden and ivory sculptures that are unique from the ancient world. So the site just keeps giving to us as we apply more and more. Some of you may have um, visited this spot in 2019 where we were fortunate enough to have an exhibition of finds from the ancient villa in the modern villa. But what a unique idea, right? It's kind of the most obvious thing to do. But we were able to do it thanks to the wonderful collaboration of our partners at the Museo Archeologico Nazionale in Naples, at the Parco Archeologico di Ecolano, at the Biblioteca Nazionale di Napoli, and other lenders. So we were able to bring the ancient bronzes from the villa into our galleries, and then people visiting our gardens could see where they stood in the ancient villa. We brought not only the statues, but busts. We brought some of the marbles as well, and some of the wall paintings that had been cut out of the wall. One of the favorites was the little statue of a piglet, which has plausibly been associated with Epicurean philosophy. The poet Horace, um, who was a follower of Epicurus, referred to himself in one of his poems as happy as a pig from Epicurus's sty. And of course, it was Horace who came up with the phrase, seize the day, make most of our life as we're living it. We shouldn't be worried about death or the gods, but we should live our life free of pain or disturbance and suffer what we will. It seems that the idea of eating and enjoying food, which is what Epicureanism is today mostly associated with, might have caused some of the Epicureans in the past to be insulted as being pigs. And they seem to have really wanted to own this. And this statuette from the villa may represent that. And another one of the finds we had was this small prosciutto-shaped portable sundial, which is really amazing. And I don't know, is it you know, pig today, pork tomorrow? But, um, but there is this Epicurean flavor to the villa. And, and that's very important. And we'll hear more about that from other speakers. And among the finds, of course, were the portraits of many philosophers. 
and, and thinkers, including Epicurus himself and, and others. As I said, we were fortunate that three scrolls like these from Naples came to us, and um, they were part of the preliminary attempts of scanning that culminated with the scroll from Paris that we talked about. Um, but if you all want to know more about the villa and the library, I shamelessly rec uh, recommend our exhibition catalog, Buried by Vesuvius, the Villa de Papiria at Herculaneum, and for uh, a digestible overview of the scrolls and their content, uh, a small book by David Sider on the library. And both of these should be available in the bookshop across the way. <laughs> Getty Trust takes all the money, I get no royalties. Um, I just want to close by mentioning these new excavations I mentioned. In the late 1990s, a massive trench was dug tracing the coastline of ancient Herculaneum, and there were problems with the water, revealing several buildings. But in the background here, you can see the very corner of the Villa de Papiri, the atrium level that was explored by Carl Weber. This is, as I said, about 5% um, or so of what Weber excavated. And excavators were able to extract more wall paintings that were left by Weber, beautiful paintings with illusionistic imagery showing a painting behind shutters on a ledge and a branch with a ribbon growing through a window. Unknown to Weber were rooms at lower levels, uh, the arrow is dropped, it should be pointing here, um, that have, again, beautiful painted and stuccoed rooms. But in many ways, in addition to the new finds, some of the most important findings of the new excavations were simply confirmatory. This is a modern excavation plan of the villa versus Weber's plan. And you can see that really, apart from not catching the angle of the pathway to the Belvedere with the circular floor, Weber was very, very exact. This is the area that's been brought to light. And then a new area down below on the coastline was also discovered that was unknown to Weber. So there are things he didn't find, but the re-excavation of what he did dig confirmed his finds in the thoroughness of his work. And they've allowed for new reconstructions of the building like this. And I've circled the new area with a seaside pavilion and seaside pool there in the corner. From that area were discovered Stunning polychromatic marble sculptures of a woman, a goddess, wearing what we call a peplos and the head of an Amazon. We had these figures here too in the exhibition. And thanks to uh, colleagues in Herculaneum and the Getty Digital team, I just have to sing our own digital praises here in this context with so many um, technologically adept people. We recreated that, uh, that room and how the statues would have stood on polychromatic bases. And then I mentioned those ivories that were found on lower levels. Here, here they are. But in all the excavations that were done, redone within the villa itself, Weber's findings were confirmed. No new papyri were found. Here's where the papyri were found. Many of them in room five, often called the library, I'd like to think of it more as a stacks, and then several around the Tablinum. Our villa has the Tablinum and the square peristyle and the atrium, but not room five. Here I show you an aerial view um, of our villa and Weber's plan. It seems to me appropriate that we celebrate the solving of the challenge, not only on the 50th anniversary of the Getty Villa, but also on the day after the Ides of March. Um, we don't hear anything about Lucius Calpurnius Piso after the assassination of his son-in-law, Julius Caesar. But it seems that the Villa de Papiri could have been where he spent his last years, removing himself from the turmoil of public life avoiding pain and devoting himself
to the kinds of philosophical conversations we know he enjoyed with Philodemus of Gadara, the author of most of the scrolls we found, and others. And with that, I'd like to turn the podium over with great pleasure to Dr. Federica Nicolardi of the University of Naples, who will talk to us more about the scrolls and their contents. Dr. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. So in one of his epigrams, Philodemus of Gadara mourns the death of his two friends, Bacchus and Antigenes. He recalls the convivial moments he used to share with the two of them and other friends. Plants and vegetables are lush and verdant. Various delicacies are ready, but the present day is not one for joyous celebration and cheerful conviviality. According to a tempting interpretation proposed by Marcello Gigante in 1983, this heartfelt epigram would refer to something happening in the Villa dei Papiri. But we neither go up to the headland nor we find ourselves, uh, ourselves at the Belvedere Sociolos as we always used to, says Philodemus. The headland, the promontory, the acte in Greek, would be the highest part of the villa. Meanwhile, the Belvedere, the, uh, so the apopsis in Greek, would refer to the Belvedere of the villa, the first area discovered by the Bourbon well diggers in 1750, where the beautiful marble floor was found. As observed by the archaeologist Antonio de Simone, after the excavations uh, in the villa resumed, the philological mastery of Marcello Gigante actually prefigured what the excavation later showed, that the villa was built on several levels following the natural slope overlooking the Gulf. Gigante's interpretation has recently been reinforced by Francesca Longo Auricchio, who convincingly showed that acte, the, word, the Greek word acte, in addition to meaning promontory, can also refer specifically to a seaside holiday villa. And she proposed that Philodemus' friends, Philodemus friends arrived uh, by sea, getting to a landing place at a lower level from which they could go up to the dwelling. If we accept that the epigram refers to the villa, it implies that Philodemus, who was born around 110 BC and died after 40, must have attended the villa at some point of his life. This aligns perfectly with the observation that he is the most represented author in the library of the Villa dei Papiri, as we will see more in detail. Within the cultural milieu of Campania, Philodemus was in contact with Ciro, the Epicurean teacher of Virgil, who lived in Naples uh, on the hill of Posillipo. Ciro and Philodemus are mentioned together in a, a passage from Cicero's De Finibus, which reveals not only that Ciro and Philodemus were friends, but also that they enjoyed the full consideration uh, of Cicero. A text from a Herculaneum papyrus which is attributed to Philodemus, but whose title is unknown, mentions the names of Ciro and the city of Naples. And Philodemus' presence in Campania is also evidenced by a passage from, the work, from Philodemus' work on Stoics, where he identifies himself as an inhabitant of the region of Naples and Herculaneum, using the expression, we Campanians. The evidence that Philodemus was well integrated into a Roman intellectual context is also supported by the fact that he addresses a group of notable Roman intellectuals, including Virgil, in a book on calumny preserved in, an Herculaneum, in a Herculaneum papyrus uh, housed in Paris at the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres. Philodemus' connections extended well beyond intellectual circles to include members of the political elite, notably, as Cicero testifies, with Lucius Calpurnius Piso Cesoninus. Philodemus himself, in another epigram of his, invites Piso to participate in the celebration in honor of Epicurus, known as the 20th, and he addresses him as friend Piso, so filtate peison. Additionally, the Epicurean philosopher even dedicated to Piso an interesting treatise titled On the Good King According to Homer, 
which is both an example of Homeric scholarship and of kingship literature, inc including uh, political advice for a ruler. Uh, and this work is preserved by uh, Herculaneum papyrus. As I mentioned before, Philodemus of Gadara holds a prominent place in the library of the villa, being the most represented author in the collection. And interestingly, his philosophical works were exclusively transmitted by, uh, through manuscripts discovered in Herculaneum, in the villa. Outside Herculaneum, Philodemus' only works that were transmitted directly are his epigrams. The library not only preserves a variety of works on diverse topics, but also reveals instances, very interesting in instances, of double copies of some of his works. On the screen, I'm showing the two copies of book three uh, on rhetoric, but this is just an example. And a notable case is the Papyrus 1021. It is a book on the history of academy, of the academy, the philosophical school founded by Plato in, uh, in Athens. And this scroll represents uh, an unstable stage of the text, uh, a heavily revised draft. And there is another intriguing example, uh, which is a papyrus preserving a uh, theological text, uh, where Holger Essler has recently identified numerous corrections aimed at refining, improving the text and in, in terms of readability and, uh, and elegance. Uh, according to Essler, this could be the only excellent example of somebody correcting the final proofs of a work. It is, of course, important to underline that identifying the author's intention to correct the text does not mean being able to identify his own hand in the text. As pointed out by the Italian paleographer Guglielmo Cavallo, in antiquity we should hardly uh, expect to an autograph of a literary work because the scribal profession was very different and distinguished from the activity of an author. It is interesting, however, to know that this kind of interventions were in papyri whose paleographical features suggest that they were written during Philodemus' lifetime. This strongly suggests that these books were directly connected, plausibly belonging to Philodemus, who died after 40 BC. In addition to books dating to his lifetime, Philodemus' works in the Herculaneum collection are also preserved in later books, which can be dated to the first century AD, so before, of course, uh, the eruption in 79, and testify to a living interest uh, towards his text in the villa, even after his death. Some examples can be found uh, in scrolls uh, written by a specific scribe, which was particularly active in the collection, and uh, copied, among others, uh, several ethic books on vices and a book on rhetoric. But what kind of works did Philodemus write? His production covers uh, various topics and various aspects of ancient philosophy. A first phase of his production uh, focused on the history of philosophy. Uh, in this group, it is worth mentioning uh, a, work, a work whose title, Syntaxiston Philosophon, is mentioned by the third, third century AD historian of philosophy, Diogenes Laertius. The title has so far never been identified in any Herculaneum scroll, but several books of it have been identified, uh, each of them focusing on a specific philosophical school, and you can see some examples in the slide. In Philodemus' production, there is also a trilogy consisting of works on rhetoric, on music, and on poems, which might seem surprising as the Epicurean philosophy rejected the traditional Greek education of which this discipline were an integral part. According to the Epicurean doctrine, music and poem and poetry can provide a pleasure, but they have no moral effects and play no role in the path to virtue. As for rhetoric, only epidictic rhetoric, which is an art, can actually be useful and is not to be condemned, unlike political and forensic uh, rhetoric. These three works, organized by Philodemus in several books, show very clearly also his intention to adapt Epicurean philosophy to a new social and cultural context, that of the late Roman Republic. And this context was markedly different from that of the flowering of Epicureanism in Athens between the 4th and the 3rd century BC. 
Philodemus cannot be regarded as a mere slavish repeater of Epicurean, Epicurean doctrine. Uh, instead, he innovated and dedicated himself to explaining and adapting while still respecting the philosophy of Epicurus, which rejected public life and non-necessary pleasures, so it was not particularly uh, fitting to the context of Roman society, by, but he adapted it to fit the context of Roman society. And in this re respect, what Philodemus intended to do with the Greek philosophical prose parallels the objectives of, uh, of uh, uh, the Latin didactic poem, the Rerum Natura, composed by Lucretius, who was a contemporary of Philodemus and an extraordinary disseminator of uh, Epicurus' doctrine. Other works by Philodemus were centered on the subject of Epicurean theological thought. Actually, although the Epicureans were often accused of being atheists, they never questioned the existence of the gods. And in his theological works, Philodemus reflects on religiosity and divine characteristics such as omnipotence, which is absolute but does not interfere in human affairs, and also investigates physical aspects, such as the atomic composition of de deities. And Philodemus also wrote on ethics, producing works such as on types of life and later on vices and virtues. Among his ethical work, one that deserves mention uh, highlights the pedagogical aspect of Philodemus Epicureanism. This particular work is titled uh, On Freedom of Speech or On Frank Criticism, and it was derived from the notes he took while attending lectures by his teacher, uh, Zeno of Sidon in Athens, lectures that, by the way, also Cicero attended. Frankness is not only an, a necessary condition for friendship, but also it holds particular, particular significance in the relationship between teacher and students, as well as among fellow students. Several other works by Philodemus are rooted in Zeno's doctrine, such as a notably challenging book on methods of inference, uh, focusing on logic and semiotics. This is a very uh, difficult text. I cannot conclude this inevitably non-exhaustive overview of Philodemus' works without uh, mentioning the mature work on death, with Marcello Gigante described as a jewel of thought and style. Here, the role of the Epicurean philosopher who does not believe in an afterword and is not afraid of death, as death, according to Epicurus, is nothing to us, becomes intertwined with the man. Epicurus' philosophical doctrine transforms into universal rules of life. All men live in a city without walls, besieged by death. But a wise man dies in serenity because his entire life, as it passes, appears to him as a succession of good moments, a, su a succession of pleasures, without fear of the future, as if he never ceased to contemplate death. In the library of the villa, we do not only have works um, by Philodemus. In an Epicurean's library, the fundamental work of the founder of the school could not be missing. Epicurus' work on nature uh, in th 37 books was part of the library. Epicurus was born in 341 BC and died in 270. Before the Archelian papyri were discovered, this paramount work was not preserved by any direct attestation. Thanks to, eruption, to the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, 35 papyrus scrolls preserving books of this work have come down to us in more or less fragmentary condition. So far, nine books have been identified with certainty, as the number of the book can be read in the subscriptio, so the title written at the end of the scroll, as you can see in one example here on the slide. It is highly plausible that the entire work was originally preserved in the library, possibly in more than one edition. It is interesting to know that the majority of papyri associated with the work on nature date back to the 3rd and 2nd century BC, so very close to the lifetime of Epicurus, and were penned by the same scribe. But there are also books dating up to the 1st century AD. The oldest books so you can see an example of the oldest book uh, on the left and the most recent book on the right. The oldest books were likely brought by Philodemus when he left Athens to come to Italy, perhaps after the death of his teacher, Zeno of Sidon, whose library they might, might have been a part of. The papyri 
written by the same hand uh, dating 3rd, 2nd century BC, were part of a single original edition, whether complete or partial. And it is possible that different and non-necessarily complete editions of a nature were collected to the, together in the library of the villa, perhaps to complement each other. And, but there are also cases where you can find two or even three copies of the same book, as in the case of uh, Book 25 of On, Rhetoric, uh, of on, on, uh, on Nature. Sorry. Uh, and this may be explained either by thinking that high interest, uh, interest in those um, specific books required uh, more copies, or that th these editions were different in terms of quality, in terms of material features of the book, or also in terms of text. The library also contains precious books by other Epicurean authors, both uh, contemporaries uh, of Epicurus and his successors, who outside of the Herculaneum discoveries were mere name to us, if not entirely unknown figures. And there is also a Stoic uh, philosopher, Chrysippus, in the, in the collection. And among the Epicurean philosopher, it is worth mentioning Demetrius Laco, a contemporary, perhaps slightly younger, of Zeno of Sidon, uh, so Philodemus teacher. Demetrius wrote uh, many works, and quite a few of them are partially readable in the Herculaneum papyri. I'm showing here two beautiful examples. On the left, you can see a work on geometry or uh, and, and the, the, where you can see also a beautiful illustration of a, uh, a triangle and some with the angles. And then uh, we also have on the right an interesting work of Epicurean philology in which Demetrius clarifies passages of Epicurean subject, uh, of, Epic of Epicurus that are subject to misinterpretations. You may have noticed that these two papyri look a little bit different than what we saw before. They appear lighter in color and more legible. This also occurs in other papyri preserving uh, Demetrius' works, even though they are dated to different times, making it difficult to attribute this feature to a particular quality of the papyrus or to bookmaking. Perhaps these books were better protected uh, at the time of the eruption compared to others. They were probably stored in a different place or a better preserved part of the library and therefore were less carbonized and, and darkened. And another area I'm certain that a systematic virtual unwrapping of all the unrolled materials will bring great uh, innovations uh, is that of Latin uh, books. There are some Latin books in the collection, but uh, unlike the highly specialized Greek library, the Latin books are very hard to frame in a general context. The, the best preserved one that you can see on the left in the slide is a hexameter poem about the Battle of Axium. And in 2018, Valeria Piano identified the name of Seneca the Elder in, uh, in the, and traces of the title of his historical work in the papyrus that you can see on the right in the subscriptio of this Latin Herculaneum papyrus, which is unfortunately in very poor condition. Other Latin papyri seem to talk about legal practices, so seem to preserve works of a le legal nature. And the hypothesis of identification of Lucretius' works in the Herculaneum papyri discovered so far, while extremely suggestive, of course, in light of the content of the Greek papyri, is now rather consensually uh, dismissed. But it could be a surprise, perhaps, in the future. And then there are some texts on sensations in the, uh, in, the, in the collection, but these are quite fragmentary. But now we, we should be able, we could be able to know more about senses, sensations, and pleasure in, uh, in the Epicurean philosophy, because this new text coming from the, uh, from the papyrus uh, Pierre Paris IV, so, uh, one of the Herculaneum papyri stored in Paris, uh, is given us, is giving us a new text on the perception and pleasure, where the author seems to be discussing about, about a way to achieve knowledge. And the author of this text could be Philodemus. Uh, it, it is, uh, in this case here, he's talking against, against his adversary. So it is possible uh, that uh, it is Philodemus. He was a uh, quite a, it was quite a, a polemical guy, but, uh, and, but there is also this very nice 
uh, ending quote from the, the papyrus, which is, it seemed to be a wish to, uh, to, to, say, to tell the truth in future books. It is possible that it is Philodemus, but we don't know it yet. We should be able in the future to read the title of the, uh, this text, and this will be a great achievement. So I conceive this uh, overview of the main works identified in the library is uh, if I were showing you around the Officina di Papiri uh, at the National Library of Naples and pulling out uh, some of the trays, some of the papyri uh, from the cabinets. And I think, I hope that from this brief overview, uh, it is clear in general terms what we accept uh, accept uh, primarily from future discoveries. So first and foremost, we accept Greek philosophical, uh, expect Greek philosophical works, although it is not impossible, albeit statistically difficult, perhaps unlikely, that there will be surprises and that texts of literary genre other than philosophical treatises will emerge. But I also anticipate significant surprises from the Latin texts which have so far only been readable in extremely fragmentary conditions, but as Gigante emphasized, must have held uh, considerable significance within the library. But also, being able to read new texts will incredibly enrich our knowledge by providing broader context that will also shed light on fragmentary texts already published. But thinking only of new texts from entire scrolls would be too limited. There are enormous prospects, even in unopened pieces of scrolls, which, once virtually enrolled, can be reconnected with each other and with other portions already enrolled in the past or even already published, fostering a stimulating joint application of methodologies for the virtual reconstruction of open scrolls and new technologies for virtual unwrapping. Not to mention that a comprehensive study will open the doors to possible research on broader aspects. Just think of scrolls that remained almost pet petrified, glued together, at attached to each other, as in the block you see on the screen on the left. And in this case, or also the numerous scrolls that present corresponding shapes, suggesting they were close to each other at the time of the eruption. Today, we have the opportunity to know what was written on the scrolls stored next to each other on the same shelf. And this opens up a completely new and unique window into the criteria of orga for organizing ancient libraries. And I'm very happy to be here with you celebrating this revolution today. Thank you so much. Now it's time for Brent. Thank you, Federica, for that wonderful talk. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and the title you see on the screen, Unburied by Technology, uh, comes as a takeoff from the 2019 exhibit that uh, I had the chance to be a part of with uh, Ken LaPatton. Uh, that title was Buried by Vesuvius, so we're using technology to, to unbury those things. I'm gonna pass around for you while I speak a couple of replicas of the two scrolls from the Parisian collection. These are printed in plastic to be exactly the same shape as, uh, as the two scrolls as they sit in the collection. And I know that because uh, they're printed from the tomography that we've used to actually read them. So I'm gonna pass these around. I'd like to thank the audience at home, and especially Stan and Karen Pigman for all of their support. Um, I'd like to thank the University of Kentucky alumni, the other UK. Uh, <laughs> we have Big Blue Nation here, here today, um, and I appreciate them making the trip out. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, all of the Scroll Prize folks for coming out, because I think this is a really important moment in the history of uh, what we've been trying to achieve. Uh, this 2019 um, exhibit did produce the prosciutto ham. I've tried a number of times to um, buy this for a Christmas present. It's not possible quite yet to get this in the gift shop. <laughs> um, 
And, and also the, the leaping pig. Um, many people may have said we would be reading Herculaneum when pigs fly. Uh, <laughs> And so tonight, tonight they're, they're flying, and maybe they'll be flying off the shelves, you know, if we can actually produce replicas. Um, thanks to Bob Fowler for his vision in uh, co-founding the Herculaneum Society, um, which uses the piglet as their, their icon. Um, and they have a description on their webpage that, that tells you why, why that's interesting. But um, Ken, I love the idea of seize the day. That's uh, apropos, and it's something I've tried to do in my work. Uh, and I seized that day where we had just in the corner of this wonderful exhibit full of artifacts from Herculaneum, we, ha we have here a TV screen that was showing the virtual part of what we were trying to do. The, the Getty Villa allowed us to put a, a small um, uh, piece of acknowledgement toward the virtual unwrapping we were trying to work on. And as part of the show in 2019, I actually did give a lecture right here at this podium on October 19th. Um, and so we're back here almost five years later and I'm at the same podium. Um, I studiously avoided wearing the same wardrobe because, <laughs> and I did that strategically by, by gaining 30 pounds during COVID. <laughs> so what I presented during that, during that lecture was the following example and it at the time was the pinnacle of what we felt we had achieved. On the left of this fragment, I'm going to train our AI system, and on the right, I'm going to ask you, when I use that AI to do inference, to see if you can see a, an, an image of a character appearing. The problem here is that the ink in Herculaneum is made of carbon, and that makes it difficult with tomography using x-ray to see that ink as a density difference. And we were using AI to see if we could tease out that signal uh, through a different way. So um, the scale of the letter form that you're looking for is, is the scale of that delta, that's about the size. This fragment is very small, it's the size of your thumbnail, and it doesn't have a lot of writing on it, but here's a, a, a rendering of the training, and the classification on the right should make uh, one letter form appear. And sometimes in thumbnail, easier to see, and those of you who have seen this example will know uh, from Stephen Parsons' work with Seth Parker and myself at the University of Kentucky that, in fact, there was a letter form there, and someone in that crowd saved my bacon by yelling out Omega. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, that was the letter form. And that was the state of the art in 2019. So Ken set up my talk by saying that I'm going to review the 275 years of technology, and in fact, I'm going to cut that short and I'm going to just eliminate 270 of those years <laughs> and ask you to go watch that video um, from 2019. Um, and, and what I'll do is just talk about the next five years, uh, the, the current five years from 2019. And um, in Oxford in 2005, at the um, invitation of Bob Fowler, who had just inaugurated the Herculaneum Society, I gave a, what I thought was a lecture that was going to light the rocket. And the rocket was going to take us to reading Herculaneum. And what I, what I eventually did was I lit a very long fuse that led to a rocket that got lit this year that took off with the Vesuvius Challenge. So I want to take some time. Um, and you see Virtual Unrolling was the article I wrote then. A, a reviewer subsequently told me, um, I just don't think unrolling is the right word because not everything is rolled up. So we said, okay, unwrapping? And so now we call it Virtual Unwrapping. It could be unpacking, it could be a lot of other things, but the virtual thing is the important thing. So let's, let's uh, reverse to, to October 2019. I gave that talk. I had lit the rocket 20 years prior and I felt like we were right on the edge of reading Herculaneum because we saw an omega. What happened three weeks later was that we were evacuated from the, um, the, the scholar housing um, and that evacuation uh, was the first time in the history of the Getty that scholars in scholar housing, and I was at the time a scholar in the Getty Conservation Institute. It was the first time that an evacuation had occurred, and 
I know that people at the Getty must have hated that this was called the Getty Fire. <laughs> am, I, am I right? Because it was not a Getty Fire, okay? It was a fire that was near the Getty, but this, I actually photographed this from a television because we were evacuated to the Red Cross station uh, where I got some free coffee and, and also I wondered what was going on, you know? Like, is everything going to, in fact, burn uh, just as I'm trying to read something that has burned, you know, <laughs> right? Um, a little bit later that year in this picture courtesy of, of Ken LaPatton, um, this is true, I started to think, uh, is there a volcano behind the replica of the Getty Villa? <laughs> so, you know, evoking, you know, these kinds of... But, but all was not lost because we got through that season so that we could be completely shut down for two years by COVID. <laughs> so this is a picture of the uh, last day uh, at, at the Getty Center for me uh, as I went to retrieve my things fully masked, separated far away from everyone else, uh, taking a picture of my reflection in the elevator. Um, as, as a setup, what I want to do is, uh, despite those, those barriers, I want to point to uh, what I think were, were three key achievements over those five years uh, that bring us to today. And I'm going to stop short of the incredible achievement of running the Vesuvius Challenge because my colleague and friend Nat Friedman will, will finish our series by talking about that and then we'll acknowledge our, our contestants. I'm going to talk about resolution, regularization, and rigor. And by resolution, I don't mean the resolve to continue going, although we had that, you know. Uh, but I want to highlight um, one of my uh, trusted staff members, uh, Seth Parker, um, who helped me achieve something very special in 2019 that we were, that we were just right on the, on the edge of when I gave that, that talk. And that is um, that we took the two scrolls from Paris and we were able to image them at the diamond light source in Oxford, England at an unprecedented spatial resolution high enough that we really thought that any kind of effect that could be possibly inside there might be something that would allow us to tease it out. And Seth is also the original coder for the tool set that we now call Volume Cartographer, and we call it that because the volumes that represent all of the internal structure of the scrolls that we deal with are, are completely unstructured when they come from the scanner, and our job is to map those so that we know where the surfaces are, where the ink is, and ultimately, uh, what the text actually says. So the path forward we had discovered was that carbon-based ink, in fact, isn't invisible in tomography. It's just really difficult to see with the naked eye because the evidence of it is, is captured as a shape change, not so much a density change. So when you take an x-ray and your bone is really thick and your flesh is not that thick, it's easy to see with your eyes uh, where the bone is and where the flesh is in the medical context. But you really want a radiologist looking at your scans if there's something more subtle going on, right? And the subtlety of the ink was something that we thought was there and we needed to find a way to tease out. And we've done some work with the electron microscope to be able to see that the textures of ink and the textures of papyrus were completely different. And Seth was the lead author on our work at the time in 2019, uh, where we basically published this uh, at the conclusion of our paper. This previously unseen evidence of carbon inks, which can now successfully be made visible, is a discovery that can lead directly to the non-invasive digital recovery of the lost texts of Herculaneum. And that was what we believed, and that was where we were in 2019. And at the Diamond Light Source, uh, through the incredibly uh, generous uh, collaboration of AIBL and the Institut de France and also the, um, the library of the Institut de France that, that actually holds this material. We were able to move the material to the diamond light source and on the right you see Madame Berard who at the time was the librarian and she accompanied all the material. And here you see Seth and myself and Madame Berard who looks about as intense about what we're doing as I do. <laughs> I, I moved over on to that side, you know, just to, to stay out of the way of um, whatever's going on there. But you see how big the working volume for these cases are? 
Um, a working volume that big uh, really defeats the idea of getting uh, a sampling rate that's so small as, as eight microns per voxel. So Seth really helped us pioneer a way in, in collaboration with those at Diamond Research how we would, we would image the scroll using the beam and the peculiar, peculiarities of the um, geometry of the beam in many, many small little sections that we could then reassemble. So on the left you see Pierre Trois 3, which is um, actually mislabeled. This was Paris 4. This was uh, the, the actual whiteboard for the annulus scan that we did on that scroll at Diamond. And we were diagramming how we would divide the scroll geometrically into very small pieces and then image all of those pieces using geometry, reflections, and the idea of an annular scan that requires a parallel beam instead of a cone beam. And all of that really stressed where the technology was at the time. And so we were able to achieve uh, the highest resolution that's ever been uh, acquired on a Herculaneum scroll. In 2009, we scanned the same scroll with a bench machine at 25 microns, and that's what a slice looks like. In 2019, at Diamond, right? There's a, it's a little bit more clarity, right? It's like the doctor gave you glasses <laughs> and, and you didn't know, you know? And so you see what this looks like and you see the marvelous data. This is the data that we submitted to the challenge. And it was because we acquired this data in 2019 that the challenge was able to succeed. This is one of the reasons why. So I wanna thank Seth for his, all of his hard work uh, for helping us acquire the, what turned out to be the golden data set. And I also want to point out that if you cut this scroll the opposite direction, you can see why it was going to be impossible ever to physically unwrap this scroll. Um, because it, it isn't just sort of dented and crushed, it's actually, you know, uh, pushed in uh, all directions. And there isn't a direction where you can sort of peel anything off without it uh, basically turning into to rubbish. Uh, and these images are, are beautiful. And I know the contestants who have explored now this data for months um, have seen this and many other versions of um, the data. I used to say that uh, I was the world's expert in what papyrus looks like in x-ray. But that's no longer true. I think there are five or eight or ten people now who are the world experts in doing that. All right, second point of regularization. Um, Resolution, huge contribution to being able to do what we've done. Regularization is the process of taking a, a protocol that makes uh, the, the data that you have cleaner and more predictable and able to be managed in a way that, that creates a lot of nice properties. And, and for regularization, I'd like to acknowledge Stephen Parsons. <laughs> yes. Stephen Parsons, PhD. Yes, Stephen defended his PhD in the summer, and here is Stephen with his mom, and um, that's us in our regalia, and you see the, there's the other UK, right? So uh, Stephen is the chief wrangler for regularization, and he, he uh, helped me with this problem on a number of different um, fronts, including experimental framework that allowed us to manage results in a really uh, systematic way with dashboarding and you know, a database management uh, ability. Um, he also uh, uh, changed our software approach to PyTorch and by doing so got us you know, aligned with what was happening in the community over the time that we've been doing this work. And in terms of the data, he helped us answer the question, do we have the golden data set? The answer is yes. And can we run larger experiments? And he systematically kept track of his work in a lab notebook, and you can see, uh, I think on the lower left, 416 pages. You know, I sort of <laughs> stopped scrolling after that, but um, for example, on 11.21.22, here's an entry where uh, Stephen noticed that in one of the open fragments, we were able to see actually ink with the naked eye. So on the left, you can see the x-ray, and very faintly, uh, the ink of those letter forms was actually turning up. Um, that
that was pretty interesting because a lot of what we had wasn't appearing to the naked eye. So we knew that, you know, the ink was on the, on the boundary of visibility. Sometimes you could see it, sometimes you couldn't. He was also able to notice patterns in the unwrapped scrolls uh, that were very interesting and looked a lot like, you know, some effect that could be coming from ink. This turned out to be very significant for the contest because contestants discovered this in the unwrapped data and ran with it, and it, I think it turned out to be one of the, um, one of the crucial moments, actually, of the competition. Um, also, you can just see that systematically, Stephen wrangled and regularized his approach so that we could take a systematic look at how to do the AI that we were doing. And that AI was done with open fragments so that we could scientifically compare how the ink actually looked, because we knew it was there, to what we could make the AI do. And one of the key contributions that Stephen made in this work um, is that he figured out how the data from the x-ray could be made to be very regular and would therefore allow much more efficient computation. I want to show you a video that comes from the Scroll Prize tutorial website. Um, because we thought it was important enough to define what a surface volume was, and that's the term that we gave this regularization approach, that, that we, they made a video to be able to show a part of the volume coming away from the scroll and then being seen as a parallel structure made of layers. That's a regularization step. That's taking something that's not actually rectilinear, it's actually uh, unpredictable in its structure, and forcing it to be rectilinear. Now, it's great if you can do that, but you need to know that you're not destroying your chance at seeing the ink by doing that. And Stephen was able to show that creating surface volumes does not destroy our ability to see the ink. In fact, it preserves it, and we're able to see the ink. So our AI approach at that point with open fragments allowed us to train on the data where we could see the ink and create a network that then we could use as an inference engine to be able to go ahead and confirm that the ink was being detected. So regularization in that data was a huge step, and creating those surface volumes allowed us to do experiments that were much uh, larger in size and allowed us to do uh, that work much more quickly uh, and with more data in the memory of the, of the system that we were using. Finally, I'll point at rigor, and I want to highlight um, my staff member, Christy Chapman. So as part of the team, Christy has been incredibly valuable for us in terms of keeping uh, our, our approach rigorous and focusing on uh, the incremental approaches that come from scientific rigor, um, not only in the uh, experimental slate, which I'll talk about in a minute, but also in the, the relational part of what we do so that the, the um, agreements that we have around the data and the stakeholders that we have who are crucial in the collaborative work that we do, um, all feel valued and feel um, that we, they, we have durable relationships and, and ways forward. So in terms of the data rights, it turns out that it takes a ton of work to be able to negotiate with the various uh, institutions that uh, hold, hold the, uh, the material that we like to work with, that we would like to work with. Um, the institutions that potentially would fund the work, uh, and the rights agreements uh, are, are complicated and they're unique. And Christie has created a, a way for us to build collaborative strength um, with a wide variety of partners. For example, the Bodleian Library and the British Library, and the Institut de France, and the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres, uh, the library also at the Institut de France and um, the library in Naples, the Getty. Uh, Ken LePatton mentioned that we imaged some scrolls that came here in 2019 at the dental school at UCLA. Okay, let's count the partners who were involved in that agreement. <laughs> University of Kentucky, the library in Naples, the dental school at UCLA, <laughs> the Getty. Uh, it was a four or a five-way agreement that took months to negotiate, 
having rigor and our ability to negotiate things is something that Christy brought to the table. But I want to talk uh, in the end here about experimental rigor um, because Christy has helped us develop a metadata framework that supports the ability to reproduce our results and to uh, allow for peer review. And this helps us achieve a really high archival standard so that we're not just telling you, the scroll says this, don't ask any more questions, uh, we'll see you on Tuesday. But, but instead, um, all the data gets released and then can be reviewed by people who have software and have the ability to uh, do that review. And that experimental slate released and pushed forward in that form is extremely important. And let me show you the set of experiments that we eventually arrived at when we started to negotiate how we were gonna do the Vesuvius challenge. So here we have three fragments we scanned at Diamond. And these three fragments, when we applied the AI, got us about that far. And this is the actual answer. Okay, so we were there. Okay, and if you wanna look at this sort of in a, a learning kind of environment, you can see the, um, the, the video is sort of playing, showing that we're converging in the right places, but we just need to improve the ability to detect the ink. And all of our signals were saying that uh, we just need more training data and possibly uh, some new approaches that could improve uh, the ability to tune this. But that fundamentally we were on the right track and that the ink would be able to be made visible. These fragments were the perfect trial for that um, here you can see a fragment edge on, and the uh, green line shows us the side that has the ink. And it's a really easy segmentation problem to be able to find that, as opposed to this segmentation problem. And I know there are some contestants in the audience who've wrestled with this segmentation problem. So we were focusing on the ability to experiment with these open fragments so that we could find, for example, in this cross-section, that there were hidden layers and we could get at those a little bit more easily, right, without the massive amount of work that it would take us to do all of that, that, that segmentation on the closed scroll. And by, by extracting the hidden layer, we could actually prove in the small that the approach probably would work in the large. So you train on the visible fragment and then you infer on the hidden one for which you have no information and try to make ink appear. This was our result. This went into Stephen's thesis as one of the key results, and it made me bold enough to say in March 2023 that we will see a true breakthrough with the virtual unwrapping of Herculaneum Scrolls. But the story doesn't stop there because one does not simply read Herculaneum, okay? Uh, enter um, the amazing um, uh, uh, Nat Friedman and the, the concept that he pitched to me in a strange reversal of fortune, um, hey, why don't we do a contest? And I'm so glad that uh, I said yes uh, because being a part of this has um, precipitated the next step in the story. And uh, that step is not one that I'm gonna explicate because Nat in just a second will be to the podium and he'll tell you, but I wanna say that we launched on the Ides of March. <laughs> and the day before, GPT-4 launched. <laughs> so we should have known, you know, it's actually beware the Ides of March, <laughs> right? So I made sure this year that we would be one day after the Ides of March and that the Academy Awards were last week, you know, not this week, so. <laughs> so what, what were the risks? Um, you know, there were some risks. It wasn't a no-brainer to do a competition. Um, were we ready? And I, I feel like I've explained to you why I, I thought we were ready on the technical side, but will our stakeholders understand? What if the competition's too easy and there's just something we missed and it ends up being just really easy? And I don't know if the competitors feel, uh, you know, obliged to shout out, was it too easy? No, no, it wasn't. <laughs> what if it was too hard? Almost too hard. Um, what if we have chaos and we don't have rigor because rigor was the third part of something that I really value? And what if, what if people make fun of us? So I want to cue up a video of people making fun of us. 
Are you ready for this? So I'm going to cue this video, so... Um. Every day, people are using AI for groundbreaking things like cheating on their homework or drawing the Mona Lisa with giant boobs. But now, <laughs> researchers are using it to unlock ancient human mysteries. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is allowing researchers at the University of Kentucky to read an ancient scroll burned by Mount Vesuvius. One word that's already been deciphered is purple, but a more recent discovery has given scientists more to translate. Wow. <laughs> purple. I mean, I was hoping for ancient wisdom or like how to summon a demon, but yeah, you know, mixing red and blue is cool too, I guess. <laughs> so a couple, couple things. Um, <laughs> First of all, what if they had done that after Omega, all right? That's one letter. Purple, actually, it's multiple letters, you know? I mean, <laughs> but they also, you know, they didn't reference the contest or the contestants who actually produced that. They're here tonight, and we're going to honor them because it's super important that um, the, um, the contestants, uh, sorry, here, the contestants were the ones who produced a prize for the first letter challenge. And when we saw the, the top of the bottle open and the first word pour out, which was purple, we knew that from then on, we're just gonna start opening more and more and more of the scrolls. So you see here, Stephen Parsons on the left, Luke Ferritor, um, you see Yusef uh, on the screen. He was un unable to attend in person. And then you see the two scroll prize guys, JP and Daniel, who are both here tonight. Um, and we were able to honor them, and even though The Daily Show made fun of us, <laughs> I'll tell you that that word purple um, unleashed uh, an amazing year in the, uh, in the history of virtual unwrapping. Um, so, resolution, regularization, and, and rigor. And here are those, those three of my trusted teammates, Seth, and Stephen and Christy, all in one shot with uh, Madame Labrie, who is the librarian at the Institut de France, uh, which is the custodial holder of the two scrolls uh, that, that, we have, that, that you have replicas of, one of which we're, we're reading now. And so uh, I, I want to finish by, by saying this, going back to the Wordsworth poem. Um, I'm afraid I've been a bit of a Pied Piper with you all, and I've uh, turned into... I, I've encouraged you to become ones who patiently explore with me the wreck of Herculaneum lore. Uh, this is the second to the last stanza of that poem, but the last stanza is this, that we're indeed a genuine birth of poesy, a bursting forth of genius from the dust. What Horace gloried to behold, what Mara loved shall we unfold. Can haughty time be just? And I just want to point out that there are a lot of people in the audience tonight who are, are those who have patiently explored. And the genius is not only the genius that we have extracted from the scroll, but it is their genius that has brought this uh, from the wreck uh, to the birth of genius from the dust. Thank you very much. So now I'd like to ask Nat Friedman to come to the podium. Wow, that was incredible. Um, all right, which, uh, is it this laptop? I think it's this one here. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, well, thank you all for being here. This is so exciting. We have a great reception to get to, so I may just kind of blast through this. Um, with that? Speed run. We're going to speed run this conversation. You've learned so much already. Those talks were, it's actually embarrassing how little I knew of what was presented um, <laughs> here today. But um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sort of briefly tell you how, I, how this, why am I, I, feel I have like a very extreme case of imposter syndrome right now. So how did this happen? How did I get roped in? 
what did we do last year that worked in, in running this contest in terms of contest design? Uh, how did we do it? And then what's next? What's our master plan? And then you are going to meet the winners. So it all started actually in COVID lockdown in early 2020. And, um, you know, I'm not, you know, I think the Epicureans believe in free will, but in this case, I'm not sure that I do because I think Amazon recommended this book for me. <laughs> and so I bought it and it was sort of this stressful moment. Uh, you know, we didn't know how bad COVID was. Um, you remember when we really didn't like, we, we know it's not good, but um, everyone was uh, Lysoling their groceries and stuff like that. And uh, I was running this really unruly company at the time. And um, somehow this idea of reading this book about ancient history, which I have no knowledge of, to be very clear, appealed to me. And I loved this book. I just like stayed up all night reading it one night. And uh, someone later told me that it was actually written for eighth graders. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, first of all, there were some very eminent talks from some very educated people. This is more my level. Um, <laughs> And second of all, I didn't notice that it was written for eighth graders. Um, someone had to point that out to me, but I really highly recommend this. I've actually emailed the author a few times to be like, your book got me into this whole thing and he's never replied. So if you know this guy. Um, so this just sent me kind of wanting to learn more about ancient Rome. And then one night I was sort of going down these Wikipedia holes. And then one night, I learned about this lavish villa in the Bay of Naples that you've heard so much about already, owned by Julius Caesar's father-in-law, that contained this huge ancient library that was unopenable and unreadable. And I just thought that this was like the wildest thing that I'd ever heard, until like later that night, I stumbled on this talk <laughs> that Brent gave right here. And so this is a weird feeling, because I feel like I've entered the screen a little bit. <laughs> I've watched this talk a couple of times. It's an amazing talk. I highly recommend it. Um, and I learned about this project to take this ancient, unopenable library of mystery burritos and <laughs> to make it readable. And in order to do this, you get to use a particle accelerator. Um, and I'm like, this is designed to nerd snipe me. Like, you're going <laughs> to, you've got mysterious, unopenable boxes of ancient knowledge, like if it may be an anti-authority impulse, but you have to find it, people say you can't open them. Well, you have to find a way to open them, and then you get to use like a particle accelerator and machine learning, and I found this picture, and uh, Brent and Seth, they look so cool, and so I just was like, wow, this is amazing. I just want to, and actually, I had sort of two reactions. My first reaction was, this is amazing. And then I became very angry because um, why had no one ever told me about this project? Like, I couldn't believe that none of my friends had told me about this amazing thing. This is the kind of thing you're supposed to share. So I started kind of going around and confronting people and asking them that. And none of my friends had heard about this before. And so, you know, my world is kind of software and tech people. And somehow the most amazing and exciting kind of an interesting uh, sort of cross-domain project that I'd ever heard of. It just no one in my world had ever heard, like it hadn't penetrated. And um, I thought, I'm just going to sort of follow along as a fanboy and see what happens. And then a couple of years passed, and um, I tried to follow the progress, but there wasn't a ton of public data. And then some friends and I, uh, we, we do these get-togethers, and we try to just like bring interesting people who are working on interesting projects. And I thought, we should bring the scroll guy. That would be amazing. <laughs> and so one day in 2022, I reached out to Brent. And um, I said, we're doing this thing. We get together in California. I know you're in Kentucky, but you should come out. And there's a bunch of entrepreneurs and tech people. And it'll be fun. And he didn't answer any of my messages. <laughs> and. So then we had to just find some way to get in touch with him. And I think I had like my assistant call your department. And anyway, Brent kind of got on the phone with me finally. And he was like, what can I do for you? <laughs> and I invited him. I said, we're doing this event. And there's going to be some entrepreneurs who have been successful. And there's going to be some machine learning and AI experts. Maybe you'll get a good idea. Or maybe someone will write a check to your lab or something like that. And kind of to my shock, um, Brent was like, what the hell? I'll come. And I was like, oh, this is great. Now, this is a picture of Brent at the event. This was October 22. There he is. And I don't remember if I told Brent it was a camping trip. Uh, 
at the time. But it was, and this was actually Brent's tent, 44, which I, was also the temperature. Um, <laughs> in Fahrenheit at night, it was incredibly cold. And so I was like starstruck when Brent arrived because I'd watched his Getty talk on YouTube like four times. Um, it's like an hour and a half into the YouTube video, so you have to sort of zoom forward. I don't, actually don't know how I found it. But, um, so I was kind of trying to frog march Brent around to all these Silicon Valley types and s sort of scroll pill more people. <laughs> and I press ganged him into doing a talk, and I said, everyone's going to come to the most amazing project. And Brent ag agreed to do that, and, um, and uh, <laughs> some people came <laughs> to the talk. That's Otavio in the tie-dye. He's very engaged. Uh, he kind of took over the talk <laughs> briefly. And um, basically, the weekend ended, and I, I, I loved Brent. We had, I think we hit it off, and, and, but I felt very crestfallen because I had sort of said, come to California. By the way, you have to sleep in this cold tent, and maybe you'll get a donation or some ideas, and none of that had happened. Um, I was the only person who was like really into this. And so I felt like I was letting Brent down and kind of California was failing. Like this is an intrinsically interesting project and everyone should love it, obviously. So the night before he was going to fly back, um, I went to meet him at his hotel with Daniel Gross, uh, my friend who's somewhere here. There's Daniel, hello. And we met in the lobby and we had a whiskey. And um, I, you know, I was trying to save the trip, basically, out of, out of, mostly out of humiliation. And I said, what if we put together a public competition? And now my background is open source. I kind of grew up on the internet, and I participated in open source projects since I was really young, in the early 90s. And the first communities in my life that I belonged to were online communities of people working together on projects. It's everything I've ever done, been involved in in my life is this. So, to me, this was not a creative idea. This was just the only thing I know how to do, basically. So it was like, what if we put together a, pu a public competition? And literally within 10 or 15 minutes, I saw Brent's eyes light up, and he said, you know, I think it's a great idea. Let me think about it. <laughs> um, but I think we could do something. And so and then I said, I'll put some money in. And Daniel said, I'll do the same thing. I'll match it. And uh, Daniel may have come to regret that later as the amount of money increased, but um, I left that sort of hotel bar whiskey feeling very excited, but as I was driving home, I started to realize like how hard, what had I done? Like I had suddenly gotten involved in like a very hard project that would require enormous amounts of work and, uh, you know, quickly realized, well, if we're going to do this, we have to like hire a full-time person. And so I started consulting with different friends for sort of advice and just talking this over and, and educating people about it. And one of my friends, who's very wise, who's also here actually, um, sort of looked into the project. And he said, Nat, there are like at least four or five PhDs left in this thing. This is like not an easy weekend project for some, or evening project for some like keyboard warrior to just solve. And um, so, th so this was stuck in my head. Okay, this is like a really hard project with multiple problems that still need solving. Now, as you saw in his talk, Brent and his team over the last couple of decades had laid an unbelievably strong foundation. We were confident it was doable, and many of the techniques were known. But there was still a lot of work left to do in that last mile. And so the concern was, and the fundamental design challenge of Vesuvius Challenge was that imagine you have to get, you know, 100 things right to solve this, and that may be very difficult. Well, if there's lots of contestants in a competition, and say four or five of them, they don't get 100 things right, but they get five or 10% or 20% of the way there, and then they give up, and they stop, well, their little bits of progress that they made will all be lost, right? So we needed some way to have a competition, we thought, that would galvanize people's interest, but also kind of slowly make incremental progress. And I, had, I was sort of, my friend who had told me this, you know, this was ringing in my ears, like maybe it is, to Brent's point earlier, maybe it's too hard for a competition. And so um, I decided to go study how people do competitions. And we talked to XPRIZE, and we talked to Kaggle, and many other people, and we couldn't find an answer. 
And so eventually, uh, we sort of struck upon this idea, which was to blend competition and collaboration in two ways. First, you have this big charismatic grand prize. So it's a major milestone. In, in this case, it was reading four passages of text from inside an unopened scroll. We know if we can do that, something amazing has happened. Second, the competition for that grand prize will bring out the best in people. It'll, it'll create huge intensity. And we've learned that from the grand prize winners, many of whom said they had to sleep for a week after the competition ended because they'd worked so hard. But the challenge with a big competition is there's no collaboration. In fact, it's adversarial. And so to fix that, we added this idea of progress prizes where we'll give small prizes along the way to people who make incremental progress conditioned on them open sourcing it. So it raises the water level for everyone. Now, somebody may have done this before. We didn't find an antecedent, but like, man, this worked so well. And it worked much better than we expected. And I would recommend that this just other people copy this, basically, because it was amazing. It, it wasn't just the open sourcing little bits along the way. What we didn't anticipate is the way it converted people from like curious, scroll curious, to like <laughs> scroll contributing, <laughs> to scroll obsessed. And because they got dopamine along the way. And in fact, the three, the grand prize team, um, all three winners um, actually won progress prizes first, and multiple, and in fact started very early in the competition. And so by the time we got to like summer, they were t already totally obsessed. And so hadn't anticipated that. Okay, so we launched the competition, Ides of March, Brent's right, that was a problem. Um, <laughs> I think it was, was my, it might have been my idea to do that. It was a horrible idea. Um, and sort of the problem was no one noticed. And so we were like, okay, what do we do? We have to relaunch somehow so that people will notice this whole thing. And the only way I could think of to do that was to raise more money. And so we actually went on like a Twitter telethon and um, we were shocked because my Twitter people, we, you know, we got retweeted and people in the Twitter network ended up contributing over like a six hour period, well over a million dollars. And we went from what was a lot of money for us, me and Daniel, <laughs> like 200 $50,000 to, I think, a million and a half dollars in our little archaeology project in, um, in a few days. So we had a big, suddenly people were sort of paying attention. And then um, we actually launched this little sub-challenge on Kaggle, and we, which is a machine learning competition website that Google now runs. And we didn't do this because we thought solving this sub-problem was the most important thing in the world or that it was the biggest bottleneck. We did this because there's a lot of smart people on Kaggle and we wanted to get the word out. And in fact, Youssef, who led the grand prize winning team, found out about the project from Kaggle. And so that was sort of successful. And then here is sort of a scroll. A scroll. Um, <laughs> here's a, a stream of the progress prizes that we issued over the nine and a half months that the project ran last year, there were 50. There were 50 different project progress prizes, and um, we made them up as we went along a lot of the time. So often we would have open-ended progress prizes that just says do something that seems like it's going to increase our probability of succeeding by the end of the year. We'd set a deadline of December 31st, and there were a few along the way that we came up with that we thought would be a good idea, and, and one of them was this idea of a first letters prize, like just, geez, it would be great to find a word. Um, we thought it was really exciting when purple was found. It's actually on my AirPods case, it says Perforus, so. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and then we also set up a Discord, and um, this was really great because people started, these scroll-obsessed people started to sort of meet each other, and actually, who, raise your hand if you're in the Discord. Well, it was a pretty good selection. I noticed they tend to skew towards the front of the auditorium. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, there is some chaos. Um, you, that's what comes with the Discord. But people were gathering and comparing notes. It was fun. It was supportive. Wayne is here who bought a CT machine on eBay and scanned a burrito. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. So a very small burrito. Um, and so it, this was a culture that was forming, and the average IQ of this team, of this group of people, was very, very high. Um, 
and the outliers were even higher. And so it was quite a lot of fun. Over time, it's grown to about 4,000 members. We're almost at 4,000. If you, the rest of you join, we will be <laughs> at 4,000. And these are some of the things that people in the community started to do. Some because they wanted progress prizes, some just because they were challenged by the, by the problem. You know, the idea that you can sit at your keyboard and unearth an ancient library from anywhere in the world. It's, it's exciting. So scroll viewers, labelers, flattening algorithms, ink detection improvements, labeled data sets. People were doing all sorts of these things. So there was a lot of kind of observation of this going on. And, and actually, in fact, someone set up an online betting market about whether the Vesuvius challenge, which was our project, would succeed or not. And <laughs> this is what it looked like in October. So they were pretty optimistic at the beginning. And then by spring, they were like less than 50%. And then it kind of quickly tailed off. Honestly, this kind of matched how I felt. Now, Brent was a rock through this whole process. He knew that it would work. But I didn't know if it would work in time. And um, I have to say, just psychologically, this was very motivating. Um, like the fear of failure and embarrassment and wanting to prove most of these market participants wrong um, really was important to me. And, um, and so the question was not, how do we kind of like referee our contest in the most you know, perfect way, it was like, how do we make sure we succeed? And like every week asking the question, how do we not get embarrassed? And so um, by spring, uh, we, we realized there was one area where we were kind of stuck. And so um, I won't belabor this, but you've seen these scans. There's the step, you know, there's three-step scan, what we call segmentation, which is tracing the papyrus surface inside the scan, and then ink detection. And this middle step of segmentation was um, largely manual and difficult. And so this is the tool, Volume Cartographer, which Seth Parker wrote. And this is sort of what the segmenters do. They, they actually manually label uh, points along a cross-section of scroll and then extrude that into the sort of 3D, extremely distorted scroll, as you saw before. And there is some automation, and some of the people here have improved the automation, but it still requires enormous amounts of manual work. And we found that scroll contestants, it was just too many steps. They weren't doing it. And so we made the kind of game time decision that we should hire a full-time segmentation team. And I think you're all here. Is that true? Conrad, Ben, and David? Yeah. Woo. Um, we don't have a segmentation prize, but but these guys deserve en enormous uh, kudos. Um, the work they did was incredibly important, surprisingly uh, skill requiring. There's a better word than that, I'm sure. Um, in fact, we hired something like 15 people to work on this, and like most of them did not work out. Like these three guys were incredible at it, and the learning curve was really amazing. Um, yeah, AI is not quite good enough to do this yet. And so they spent many hours tracing papyrus, and then we would release those flattened surface volumes that Brent showed you earlier, and we tracked their progress starting from May 1st in terms of square centimeters of traced papyrus. And we knew in our heads, like, okay, there's some threshold where there's enough square centimeters out there that the grand prize is winnable without doing additional segmentation, and we were just like racing to get to that point. And so this was a big unlock. And it sort of broke the mold of a contest. Like, wait a second, you're a referee. Why are you like running out onto the field and kicking the ball? Um, you're not supposed to do that. But the betting market was really worrying me. And so <laughs> that's why we did it. And so in one of these segments, another participant um, building on uh, or certainly relating to um, Stephen's discoveries of the visibility of ink found not just a little bit of ink, inside of one of these segments, but letter forms. And that, that was Casey Hanmer, who's also here. And Casey, um, <laughs> Casey has a very nice haircut. And um, he also 
um, like fairly promptly shared this with the rest of the community, this discovery that he'd made. And that led to the First Letters Prize very shortly thereafter when Luke and Yousef trained on the patterns that Casey had found with machine learning and were able to find many other uh, letter forms and, the, and this first word. And Casey won the first Inc. Prize for this extremely important discovery, which he did in a Mathematica-based viewer using a technique called persistent direct inspection, um, AKA looking at it a lot. <laughs> and, okay. So hiring a segmentation team was not part of our original vision, but it was critical to progress. Um, I'm just gonna tell you like one other story like that. Uh, a few months later, in September, we had actually secured permission and uh, used some of the generous donations to pay for beam time to, scroll, to scan some more scrolls that came from Naples. And that was uh, going to be at the end of September. And you book the beam time on these particle accelerators months in advance, and you get this very limited window, so you have to show up on time and use the window to you know, do your scanning and get out of there. And Brent uh, was in um, Naples with the scrolls getting ready to go when we had this combination of weather and a nation. The, the scan date was the tw 30th, I think. Is that right? And so anyway, we got this urgent call. Um, ah, we're not going to make it. I got very excited because finally we had a legitimate nonprofit justification for chartering a jet. <laughs> and this is Brent with the scrolls uh, heading up to, um, and Brent tells me he refuses to fly commercial now. So, <laughs> Okay, so summing up the story so far, how we did it, we tried to blend competition and cooperation. We built an army of internet nerds, which is unstoppable if you get them together, and many of them are here, so be careful. We were fear afraid of embarrassment, and we didn't try to not be afraid of it, and then we tried to do whatever it takes. So what is next? Well, we have a master plan. It's on the website. I'll summarize it for you. The first thing we have to do is automate segmentation. We have to scan all the rest of the scrolls, and then we have to excavate the villa. <laughs> And we want to do it fast. We want to speed run this process. Um, we're not patient because who knows? You know, there's fires and landslides. So segmentation, uh, in 2023, it improved over the course of the year. But on average, in 2023, it cost us $100 per square centimeter to segment the scroll. And there's some math here, which leads to um, three and a half coliseums, roughly, is the cost to to segment all the scrolls, clearly impractical. We have to automate this. Here, by the way, is uh, Richard Jenko with uh, unrolled simulated scroll. They're very long, as you can see. And so we have to automate this. And actually, the good news is progress is occurring. Julian, where's Julian? Raise your hand. Julian over here dropped on basically on Christmas Eve. <laughs> The beginning of an auto segmentation algorithm. It's 10,000 lines of code. Um, it could probably be shorter. Uh, <laughs> and this is an, an automatically generated segment. And then uh, hopefully some of the other people here will help us um, figure this out as well. And uh, Julian also recently joined. He won the prize, and he recently joined the Vesuvius Challenge organization as a full-time employee to finish this work. So this is very exciting. <laughs> Once auto-segmentation is done, we need to scan all the scrolls. So how do we do that? Well, uh, some scrolls have been scanned, and, and Brent and, and Seth and the team have worked out some great protocols for that over time. But we need to add several zeros to the number of scanned scrolls. And so we have to figure out the optimal protocol to do that efficiently. And then we actually have to get access to the facility, whether it's a we don't know if it might be possible to scan on a bench source uh, without physically flying with a private jet. Every two scrolls have to go in a separate private jet. That would be, maybe it's possible with a bench source. Um, or maybe we can just rent a particle accelerator for 90 days. So we asked Diamond if they would rent it to us for 90 days, and they said no. But we did <laughs> book about 12 days of beam time over the next year or year and a half, which this is my math, so it's probably wrong. But in the best case, that's like 100 to 200 scrolls, which is a lot. OK, so we scan all the scrolls. We're going to figure that out this year. And then we won't do it, but we'll figure it out. 
And then we need to excavate the villa. I was very interested in uh, uh, Ken's much better images of the tunnels. Um, I got to go in the tunnels in October, and these were pictures of my back of my head. And this one was not clean. The ones that you were showing were very clean. This one was very dirty. Um, but uh, what I did, what I was extremely impressed by was how, how little explored the villa appears to be and how, what a tiny fraction of the villa is tunneled through. And uh, I think right on the right here is this cubby. I don't know if there's a room five. I'm all confused. But this is where I was told many of the scrolls were found. And it's very small. It's like as wide as this, maybe slightly wider than this lectern here. And, you know, maybe we've explored 5% or I don't know what you would estimate. I also um, brushed up against the dirt on the side of the wall, uh, exposing this... Um, I think this is a like a frescoed piece of wall, um, and just giving me the impression that there's a lot of undiscovered stuff here. And so I think it's very important to dig out the rest of the villa and restore it to its former glory, um, or cl whatever, close to its former glory. And so I asked Mid Journey to make an image of excavating the villa, and this is what it made. And I don't know if backhoes are appropriate. Um, <laughs> So we will, we should consult with an archaeologist, so, but maybe it would be fast, so. Okay, so the master plan is to automate segmentation, scan all the scrolls um, as quickly as possible while we're all, while some of us are young, and then to excavate the villa, and if we can do all that, there's a sort of a payoff. Brent said it much more beautifully, but uh, maybe history will be rewritten because there's parts of history that we don't have as much information about as we should. Maybe we'll have beautiful ancient literature or philosophy. Maybe there will be a new renaissance of the classics, and there will definitely be eternal glory, <laughs> or at least for another 2,000 years. So I want to say thanks to so many people. I mean, I just am a carpetbagger who showed up at the last minute here and, and got to help nudge things along a little bit, but the, the team from Aduce Lab Brent, Christy, Seth, Stephen, everyone there, all of the work they did, uh, n you know, none of this would have happened without that. Um, Vesuvius Challenge itself, we had to form a team. JP uh, was absolute driving force <laughs> over the last year. When I, when I drove away from that whiskey with Brent and Daniel, I was like, my God, this is so much work. We've got to hire someone, and we could not have found someone better than JP to do it. He was amazing. Daniel Javier, uh, so many other people. We've recognized the segmenters. Um, it, 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 so many people were essential. So many people were load-bearing to this actually working. Our paparology team, um, I'm glad someone else said Omega earlier, uh, because most of us working on this do not read Greek. Um, and so it's sort of this hive mind that's necessary. The, the difficulty at times, most often the reward of this project is the tension between different types of groups of people with expertises coming together to do it. And the paparology team worked incredibly hard when we had the grand prize submissions, the first letter submissions, to help us read and adjudicate and interpret those. That was a very intense period of work for them. The many partners who have made this possible, thank you as well. And then, thanks to everyone on the internet, who donated a lot of money. Um, the biggest one there is recent, uh, but um, this, this, this was amazing. Most of these people contributed to this project when it was not at all clear that it would work. And some of you are here, and so I want to say thank you. And finally, to our community, thank you. This has been fun. There's a culture, there's a community that has formed around this. So on behalf of everybody at Vesuvius Challenge, Thank you very much. And so now we get to recognize our prize winners. To do that, to help me do that, please, uh, I'd like Brent to just rejoin the stage environment up here. And um, do you want to kind of kick off? Uh, is there a slide? I don't, I don't, I don't yes, have Yes, I'll kick off. Okay. <laughs> 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 so before recognizing the actual competitors in the Vesuvius Challenge, I actually have a uh, prizes to award to my uh, staff members from uh, the University of Kentucky. 
uh, who I talked about tonight. Um, Seth is not here, but I'd like to ask uh, Christy Chapman and uh, Stephen Parsons to come to the podium. And so, yes, on behalf of the University of Kentucky, my research lab, and the Vesuvius Challenge, I'd like to present to you something that will memorialize your contribution uh, to the success of this work and to the success of the Vesuvius Challenge. If you could just open it up and show the audience. This is to certify that medium pig head left. <laughs> Original bronze sculpture. Seize the day. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Uh, do, we, do we stay? Yeah. So, okay. So now we are going to, um, we have actually in attendance here, not only grand prize winners, but some of the runners up as well. And so we're going to recognize them. And Stephen, I need your help because there's a lot of things that I don't, I'm pretty useless, actually. Um, <laughs> but I think, do, do we have a, do we, do we need the thing? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> so first runner up I want to recognize is SQ Ma. Are you here, SQ? Ah, excellent, yes. <laughs> come on, no, come to the stage. This is, uh, <laughs> yep. okay. congratulations, fabulous work, congratulations. And here you go, it's a gift bag, and please don't lose that, Chuck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry? Yeah, you stay. Oh, no, you should stay up here. It'll be more fun. Yeah, go in the corner <laughs> over there. Because then we'll have a lot of people on stage. <laughs> All right. All right. Our All next right. runners up, Lou, and I'm so sorry, I'm going to say this wrong, Arefe? Aref, oh, yes, th is that okay? Pretty bad? Okay. Thanks. Great to meet you in person. Thank you for coming. Good to see you. Congratulations. Okay, here you go. Why don't you both hold it? Okay. Congratulations. 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 Elian, Sean, Leonardo, and company. There's quite a few people in this. Please come up. Congratulations. Wow. You do too, I just Hey! Congratulations. <laughs> it may not be valid, I don't know. Okay, so congratulations to the runners up. They did incredible work, super, super amazing. Really stood out from the pack. We had quite a few entries, and uh, the work these folks did was phenomenal. Um, now we're going to re <laughs> gonna recognize the grand prize winners. That's You've heard their funny. names. Um, you know them well. Here is actually the reaction shot when they learned <laughs> on Zoom that they'd won. Julian's head is covered. It's fine. But you can see Yousef was very, very happy. This was incredible. All three of these contestants uh, joined the project in the first week. So even though we had this bad launch, somehow they found out about it all in different ways. One from a podcast, one from Kaggle, one from another thing. It was strange. And, uh, and then they all won progress prizes, and then they all teamed up and formed this dream team at the end of the year. It's, the, it's like a, the best possible story arc. So please, Luke, Julian, come to the stage. <laughs> you want to give it? Okay. 
Thank you, Dr. Congratulations. <laughs> Yousef unfortunately couldn't make it um, because U.S. immigration didn't let him in. We actually had Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell call the State Department. Didn't help. Um, however, we need more corruption in the U.S., not less. But however, um, <laughs> Yousef sent us a message I'd like to play for you all. So it's, it's about one minute long. Hello everyone. One year ago, I embarked on this incredible journey with the Vesuvius Challenge. Today, when I look back, I almost can't believe what we have accomplished. This achievement was built on the efforts of so many people from the Vesuvius organization, so much progress from Induce Lab and Professor Seal's team, and so much heart and soul poured from everyone from organization to technical review teams. Thank you to everyone who was involved. I am honored to be part of this incredible effort. I am forever in awe of Nat's vision that this at all was possible and to imagine of, that this challenge was a possibility. I would like to thank my teammates who embarked on this journey with me and who helped me reach this incredible milestone. Thank you guys. I would also like to thank my parents for believing that I could achieve this long before I did. My brother for his late night speeches and my incredible wife for her unwavering support. I'm sad I don't get to share this moment with you, but I am sure more celebrations will come. Thank you and have a nice evening. Yousef was the team leader of the grand prize winning team with Julian and with Luke. And so it's sad he can't be here physically, but, but he is with us in spirit. And um, so with that, I don't want to play again, but I want to say thank you. Thank you.